Hello and welcome to the New Testament Daily with me, Jerry Dierman, where we read and talk through a chapter of the New Testament every single day. I'm glad you're here because reading God's Word daily will change your life. You can also help others find out about this resource and stay in the Word daily when you click like on this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, or share this link with others. So let's pray and then we'll jump into God's Word. Father, thank you so much for the precious, written, inspired, living Word of God. And I pray that by the Holy Spirit, each of us would hear exactly what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, this is uh, known as the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And here's what it says. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Let me just stop right there and put this into a bit of context here. Paul introduced in the last chapter, the manifestation, nine manifestations of the Holy Spirit, or as we commonly refer to them, the gifts of the Spirit. And so thank God for the gifts of the Spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit being sent. And thank God for His power that not only manifests on our behalf, but manifests through us. Jesus wants us to be able to minister with the power of the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus ministered with the power of the Holy Spirit. So Paul says, though I speak with the tongues. Now, we should insert the word languages there, because he's not talking about speaking with somebody else's tongue. He's talking about speaking languages that are not languages that you learned growing up. This is not your native tongue or language. So Paul says, even though by the Holy Spirit, by His power, even though I speak with the languages of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. So what Paul's saying is, you may be a spirit-filled person, you may be able to even pray in spiritual language, or you may be able to give a message in tongues, as it talked about in the previous chapter, uh, a gift of the Spirit, speaking out a message from God in the spiritual language. Paul said, you you may be able, by the Spirit, to speak in a language of human beings, maybe of some remote tribe somewhere, because this has happened before, where people have recognized their own language when somebody's speaking in tongues, okay? In fact, that happened in Acts chapter 2 with all these Jewish people that had come for the feast from all around. They discern, they're speaking my language, these these Galileans. How do they know my language? Well, it's by the Holy Spirit speaking in spiritual language. So Paul said, I may be speaking with the languages of men or even the languages of angels. That's very interesting, isn't it? But here's the point. He said, but if I don't have love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. You think about those cymbals that they cling together, you know, like in a marching band, clang, clang, clang. And so here you think you're really doing something spiritual and people are going to esteem you because you're blah, 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 you know, speaking in some great language. And Paul said, yeah, but if you don't have love, then as powerful as it is to speak in a spiritual language, he said, it just becomes like clanging brass, like a sounding brass, a clanging cymbal. In other words, it's noise, but it's not effective. Paul is going to introduce here that the kingdom of God does come with power, but the kingdom of God comes in love, in love. God is a God of love, and he doesn't just want to exercise and show his authority. If God wanted to do that, he'd just come down and kill us all. God could, but he doesn't. See, he's not just a God of power. He's a God of love. So Paul is saying, we need to be like that too. So just because I can speak in tongues, if I don't have love, then it's it's become a lot of noise. It it negates the effectiveness of the power. Verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy, now I'm speaking in a language that everybody understands that I know. I know this language, but it's still a prophetic word by the Spirit of God. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, boy, that's powerful, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Wow. You know, everybody would think if you have faith and you can just 
cause things to happen by praying and declaring things and you're getting things done with your faith, Paul, you would think that's something great. But Paul's saying, look, but if it is without love, it's nothing. It's nothing. It must have love. It must be motivated by love. Verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, you would think somebody that sells everything they have to be able to feed the poor, that that would really be something. But he said, though I bestow all of my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Somebody said, well, wait a minute. If you're bestowing all your goods to feed the poor, you are walking in love. You know, that's not necessarily true. I mean, it, it's maybe likely true, but it's not necessarily true. And I think that's clear from what Paul's saying, because what's the motive of the heart? Was the motive of the heart to look good? Was the motive of the heart to do something so that something would be done back for you? See, that's a form of flattery. Paul's saying, no, no, you can even do things that look like love and it not be love and it not be counted. And so he goes on to now explain, he's going to explain the characteristics of this God kind of love. Verse four, love suffers long. Oh, just that one right there. I don't know about you. But if I have to suffer, I don't want to suffer long. I want to suffer short. But love will suffer long. Think about a woman having a baby and the, the intensity of those contractions and the pain of the whole thing to deliver that child. But how she wants to do it. And then once the baby is born, she forgets about that pain and she's so overjoyed because of love. See, so love is willing to suffer. Well, guess what? That's not the last time that mother's going to suffer because when she goes to raise that child, she's going to have to sacrifice again and again and again and again. And she'll realize very quickly it was easier to have that baby in the womb than to have that baby out of the womb because now you got to take care of that baby and it was easier to take care of in the womb. But what does she do? And a good dad, what do they do? They suffer. They sacrifice. When they're tired, they're caring for their child. See, and so love suffers long. This is the same with a husband and a wife. This is the same with neighbors. This is the same with everybody. When you love, you're willing to suffer yourself to benefit somebody else. So love suffers long and is kind. I don't know about you, but that one challenged me, challenges me sometimes because especially if I get tired, I can not be as kind as I normally would be. And, but love is kind. If the love in your heart is kind, and if you have God inside, if you're born again, then the love of God is down in there. We'll see that another time. Love, is, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love, when somebody else comes and says, hey, look at my new car, my new house, or my new anything. You don't think in your mind, well, why do you get that? And I don't get that. Love can really say, oh my goodness. That's awesome. And be excited for that person. Love can genuinely be excited for somebody else when they get what you wanted because it's love. It's, it's not selfish, see? So does not envy, does not parade itself. You know, a lot of us in our natural selves are pretty selfish. And in fact, all of us are. Our carnal side is very selfish. And we like to, you know, parade ourselves or like people to see what we did to make sure that they see, hey, I did that or that was my idea and such. But that's you. That's not love. That's you. Doesn't mean you're a horrible person. But this is God. God is love. God's like this. Love does not parade itself. Notice is not puffed up like haughty or prideful. Does not behave rudely. Have you ever seen people behave rudely? Well, that's not love. That's not love. And uh, I've seen it happen, and I've done it. Well, I don't want to do it, though. I want to be like this, don't you? I want to walk in love. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Not just looking out for number one. I'm looking for the benefit. What about everybody else here? Is everybody else also taken care of? That's love. That's love. I told you this was challenging. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Love is not provoked. You know what I think about when I read that? I think about how many people say, well, he made me mad. Well, she made me mad. Yeah, well, she made me mad. Oh, she made you. 
That meant that you were provocable. That meant that they might have copped a little attitude. Maybe their attitude was wrong. But it provoked you to walk outside of love. That means that you weren't walking in love. See, and I'm not saying that there aren't extreme cases where we shouldn't just be, you know, Dorothy Doormat or, you know, uh, or, you know, some man that just is a pushover and lets everybody walk all over him. No, that's not what the Bible's saying here. But on the other hand, you're not just so weak that somebody just provoke you a little bit, you know, call your name or just push your button and you just fly off the handle. You start saying things out of love. See, that's not love. That's not love. Boy, this is describing how God is. This is describing how Jesus was. And so it says, love is not provoked. Notice this, love thinks no evil, doesn't even think evil. That's interesting, isn't it? Love does not even think evil. Boy, Lord, cleanse my mind and my heart that I may walk in such love that evil things, uh, hurtful things to other people don't even come to mind. Notice, love does not rejoice in iniquity. Love doesn't do that. Somebody goes to sin, somebody takes advantage of somebody else. You know, they're an opportunist, they steal, they loot, uh, or they overpower somebody, someone who were, was weak or the elderly or whatever. Love does not rejoice in that. So when somebody tells you, hey, look what I did, look what I did, maybe the carnal side of you would say, dude, you did that? Man, I, that's crazy. But the love side of you would say, man, that's not right. That's not right to treat somebody like that. That's wrong. It's not right to sin like that. So love does not rejoice in iniquity, but love rejoices in the truth. Love rejoices in the truth. When love hears truth, love rejoices. Why? That's truth. I rejoice in the truth. Notice this. Love bears all things. Let me say it another way. Love puts up with everything. <laughs> In life, life happens. It, it never just goes perfectly. Sometimes it seems to go more perfectly than other times. But let me tell you, life just happens all the time. And people that are not in love, they just don't bear it. In fact, they'll even say, I'm not going to put up with this. Why, why this? Why that complaining all the time? Love is not complaining. So it says love bears all things. It deals with it. Notice this, love believes all things. Love believes. That, that does not mean love is gullible. But love is in faith. Love is in faith for all things. And, and some people might call this optimistic. But love believes that there's a way we can make this work. Love believes there's a way that we can bless the person or help the person or mitigate the situation, the, the adverse conditions. Love believes there's something. Love sees opportunity. Love sees potential. Love sees that there's got to be a way that we can help and make things right. That's just the way love is. And so he goes on to say, love hopes all things. Love hopes all things. So love still has hope even when others are hopeless. The love of God still hopes. And then it says, love endures all things. Love just sticks it out. See, uh, there are some people who are difficult people. And others around them would just you know, say, you know, I'm done. And certain other ones may persist to help them and bless them. But after a while, they say, I'm done. I'm done. But somebody truly walking in love can hang in there a, long, a much longer time because they endure all things. And then it goes on to say, love never fails. Love never fails. And that not only should be applied, that love uh, will bring about the best outcomes better than anything else that we do. Love never fails. But also, uh, because of the next verse it says, or the next sentence it says, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. So really, love never fails is saying, love will never cease to be important and effective. Love will never cease. Prophecies, eventually, when Jesus comes back, we won't need prophecy anymore. Uh, tongues, when Jesus comes back, we won't need tongues anymore. We just need it right now when we don't have the Lord with us and we don't have all the knowledge we need. He said, those things will vanish away. Verse 9, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. For we know in part. None of us know 
very much compared to God. So we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Nobody prophesies everything. We only prophesy the little piece that God gives us. Verse 10, but when that which is perfect is has come, then that which is in part will be done away. And so that which is perfect had come. This is talking about when Jesus comes back. Somebody will tell you, well, that's talking about when we get the Bible. Once they got the Bible, we don't need the gifts of the Spirit anymore. No, that's not what that's talking about. No, that's not what that's talking about. This is talking about when Jesus comes back, when that which is perfect has come, when Jesus brings about the restoration of all things. Then these things that are in part will be done away. Verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we see face to face. And you know, the mirror is like, the mirror of God's word. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about the mirror of God's word. And we look into God's word and we see the image of Jesus in there, but we can also see our own image and where we don't measure up like this chapter. Not a one of us measure up 100% with all these love characteristics, but oh God, help us to do it. Help us continue to perfect us with love. So it says, for now, in this age, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. See, that's that which is perfect has come. We're going to be face to face with Jesus. See, we'll see him face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. And now abide faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is what? Is love is love. So notice faith is important. Hope is important. But love trumps all. Love trumps all. And so the Lord wants to work these things in love. Now what's interesting is that chapter 12 talks about the gifts of the Spirit. Chapter 13 talks about love. And then chapter 14 is going to talk about how to minister in the gifts of the Spirit in love. And that's how these three chapters intertwine and go together. But the, the linchpin between chapter 12, the gifts of the Spirit, and exercising the gifts of the Spirit in chapter 14 is chapter 13, which is love, which is love. And so let's do this, can we? Let's close our time together and ask God to work His love in our hearts. Well, I don't know about you, but as I read these, I think, oh, I still need to be perfected in love. As much as I've grown, I still need to grow some more. And so, Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for your holy word. And we thank you for reminding us that love, your kind of love, the way you are, the way that Jesus is, is different than our selfish, carnal selves. And so we ask you, Lord, by the Holy Spirit, that you would work these things in us. Help us to suffer long and be kind. Help us not to envy. Help us not to parade ourselves. Help us not to be puffed up or haughty. Lord, help us to not seek our own. Help us to not be provoked. Help us, Lord, to think no evil. Help us, Lord, not to rejoice in any sin or iniquity, but help us to only rejoice in the truth. Help us to bear all things. Help us to believe all things. Help us to hope all things. And Lord, help us to endure all things. And Lord, we thank you that as we walk in love with other people, more and more, better and better day by day. We thank you, Lord, that that love will not fail, but that love will cause the gifts and power of the Spirit and every other thing we do to be a blessing to people. It'll cause it to be that much more effective because it's done in love. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, that's the famous 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I look forward to being with you tomorrow. 1 Corinthians 14.